Good morning. Someone's been wearing my microphone. I feel like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Somebody has been wearing my mic. Good morning, everyone everywhere, and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lisa, and it just always fills me with joy when we can gather together to worship. Here in Homer, we do live, work, and worship on the ancestral land of the Denina and Sukpiak peoples who have cared for this place and are continuing to care for it. As we reckon with the colonial sins of the church in Alaska, which in many places robbed Native peoples of their language and culture, we commit ourselves to being in peaceful and healing relationships, acknowledging the past and looking with hope to the future. If you are worshiping online today, a warm welcome to you. Please be sure you say good morning in the comments, like the video, and be sure to send us a message if you have any special prayer request. Today we are starting a new worship series called Setting a Spacious Table. We will be exploring the ways that Jesus lived a life of hospitality. He welcomed people into his ministry. He welcomed people to his table. He welcomed people into his very life. He did this through being authentic and vulnerable with others, by seeing people as they truly are, and welcoming their woundedness. When we practice these things, we partner with God to create spaces of healing for ourselves and for others. This is a collaborative series these next few weeks. I am thrilled that my friend and colleague, Pastor Aaron Day, will be joining us here in Homer the next two Sundays to preach and lead worship with me for this series. Pastor Aaron will also explore with you and introduce our small group program for this fall, which are Spacious Table Gatherings. This is a small group ministry created by Pastor Aaron and will be an opportunity for us to be able to gather together in small groups, to share share table fellowship with each other, to deepen our relationships, to have time of reflection and worship with one another. And these gatherings are not just limited to those in our church family. They are great ways to welcome friends and neighbors into your life as well and strengthen your relationships with them. In a few weeks after you have heard more about this from both me and Pastor Aaron, you'll have a chance to sign up. And in October, we'll have a training for table host with Pastor Aaron. Aaron. I am so excited to have her join with us as we explore what it means to practice a theology of hospitality. Would you please stand as you're able and join with me in our opening prayer? The responses are in bold in your bulletin or on your screen. Let's pray together. God, when our hearts feel like empty tombs, when we are afraid to share our true selves, when we feel compelled to put on a happy face, Strengthen us, we pray, and help us find our voice. When we struggle to forgive, when we overlook the needs of others, when we neglect the weak and cater to the strong, forgive us, we pray, and grant us courage. When we are confined by our wounds, when we hide our hurts, when we long for connections, yet struggle to build authentic relationships, Heal us, we pray. Touch us with your wounded hands and set us free. When we are locked behind our doubts and fears, pass through our barriers, open our hearts, and give us peace. Amen. I invite you to remain standing and join in our opening song. It's number 2271 in the black hymnal, 2271, Come, Come, Everybody Worship, number 2271. Everybody worship with a prayer or song of praise. Come, come, everybody worship, worship God always. Worship and remember to keep the Sabbath day. Take a rest and think of God, put your work away. Come, come, everybody worship with a prayer or song of praise. Come, come, everybody worship, worship God always. Worship and remember the Lord's unending care Reaching out to love and help people everywhere 
Come, come, everybody worship with a prayer or song of praise. Come, come, everybody worship, worship God always. Worship and remember your blessings great and small. Give to God an offering, show your thanks for all. Come, come, everybody worship with a prayer or song of praise. Come, come, everybody worship, worship God always. Worship and remember how Jesus long ago taught us how to talk to God, something we should know. Come, come, everybody worship with a prayer or song of praise. Come, come, everybody worship, worship God always. Worship and remember that God is like a light, showing you the way to go, ever burning bright. Come, come, everybody worship with a prayer or song of praise. Come, come, everybody worship, worship God always. You may be seated. Please bow with me for the prayer of illumination. Living God, as the risen Christ entered the locked room of the first disciples, may your healing love and light enter into our hidden hurts and shadowy spaces through the power of your word and spirit to breathe new life into us. Amen. Today's scripture is a familiar one. In fact, we hear it every year on the first Sunday after Easter. It's the story of a resurrection appearance by Jesus to his disciples. One disciple, Thomas, expresses doubt at what the other disciples claim. Today, let's listen to this story through the lens of hospitality. How does Jesus welcome Thomas and his doubts with compassion and vulnerability? Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. This is John 20, 19 to 29 from the New Revised Standard Version. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite the children to come forward to join me and Miss Caroline together for a few minutes. We have some new, we have some visitors today too. Hmm. When we have, when we have a new visitor, what do we usually do? We we have two visitors today, and they live in Washington. Is that correct? Yep, they live in Washington. So what do we usually do when we have visitors? We wave, and we say hi, and then we get to know you a little bit just by. Can you tell us your name? My name is Adalian, and this is my little brother Coke. Okay, Adalian and Coke. 
We're so glad you're with us today. And do you want to say your name? Yeah. This is Say. Sorry. Yes. It's, and um, this is our pastor, Pastor Lisa. And I am a member of the church, and I'm just doing children's time this week. And it's my pleasure. So welcome. We're glad you're here. Are there any other children? Oh, young at heart. My goodness, I hardly recognize Johanna. Wow, something happened over the summer. <laughs> well, I guess you won't be coming up to children's time anymore. <laughs> you could do it yourself next time. You could come up here. Well, I have been so busy because I'm going to have a dinner guest at my house. So I've been cleaning, and I picked some flowers out of my garden. My house is super clean. I, I just, I'm really excited because this is somebody I've wanted for a long time to come to my house. I've decided I'm going to invite Jesus for dinner tonight. Oh, I don't know what made me do it. I just decided, why not? Why not invite Jesus? So the first thing, I cleaned my house. Of course, that's really important. And I planned my menu, got the flowers. I even brought out a Scrabble game in case he wants to play a word game. I hope we talk, though. I hope we have lots of interesting conversation. The thing is, this is what I'm stuck with, an invitation. I don't know how to get it to him. I even put my name at the top. And I wrote down who I wanted to. I was looking for a mailbox when I came in here. And that box back there is for money offering. So I don't know quite what to do. But I'm going to show you my invitation because I think maybe Jesus might be watching. So I'm going to send this to him. Let's see. I opened it up. It has a sunflower on it. This was done by my aunt, <laughs> my Auntie Caroline. And so it says, can you read that, say? What does it say? Yeah, and just so he can find me, I put a smile face because that's my signature when I taught school. And I'm all ready. I've got the invitation. My house is clean. Now I don't know what to do with the invitation. So I've got to think about this for a minute. <sighs> so I have the name on the card, and I want him to come. How am I going to make sure that he gets this? Where is he? Any ideas? Hmm, do you think heaven? Up, maybe? Do you think he's going to get this to the mail? Should I take a picture of it and send it via email? Hmm, I just don't know how I'm going to get Jesus to come to my home for dinner. But, you know, sometimes when I have problems, I go to the Bible. It seems to solve my problems. So this morning, I got up early and I thought, here I am with the invitation. I forgot to put it in the mail. I didn't know what kind of stamp to put on it. I think I'm going to look at the Bible and just see if it'll help me. And I found something in the Bible. And this is what it said. Jesus sent his disciples out into the world to tell everyone the good news about God's love. But before they left, Jesus gathered them together, just like we are gathered here. And he told them some important things. And Jesus said to his friends, and I'm his friend, so I think he meant me, anyone who welcomes you is welcoming me. And anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Hmm, good words. Jesus also said, and if you even give a cup of water, cold water, to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. So I looked at those lines again, and I saw that Jesus told his disciples that whoever welcomes or invites him welcomes Jesus. So how am I going to invite Jesus into my house? Hmm. Well, I read this, and this is what I think. I think I can invite one of Jesus' disciples or one of his friends because this is what it says. If you are kind or you invite one of Jesus' friends or Jesus' disciples, you're doing it to me. So I can find a friend of Jesus to invite to my home for dinner tonight. Oh, my gosh. Now I have to find a disciple or a friend of Jesus. Do you know any? Raise your hand out there if you are a friend of Jesus or a disciple. Look at all those people I can invite to dinner. Too bad my house is small. <laughs> and I only have one fish. <laughs> That's it. I can invite another person to my home and someone who I know is a friend of Jesus, someone who's, who I know is a disciple. And I can have a nice meal, and it's like I'm inviting Jesus into my home, and I am welcoming him. Wow, that is so nice because he cannot possibly go to everyone's house for dinner. And I was wondering how he was going to get to my house tonight at 6 o'clock. 
Oh, I don't have to worry. All I have to do is be nice to the people around me, look for disciples, hopefully a friend of Jesus, and get them involved, and I have done something that I know would please Jesus. What a relief that is to me, and that is good news. So, are you friends of Jesus? Are you a disciple? Every day we have an opportunity to invite someone to do something with us, whether it's come play a game, come swing on the swing, let's go over to the neighbors and see if she's got any cookies, let's share our fish, I know people do that, let's share some berries, right? We do that. Let's invite somebody over that was new to our neighborhood. We have a lot of new people in Homer now. Homer's kind of grown. And so we have those people that we can invite to come into our church with us. That's a good thing to do. Or to have dinner at our home, or just to even go picking berries or have a fish, right? We are so surrounded by people. And so that is good news because there's so many disciples here. Well, I don't even have to travel up to heaven. This note doesn't even have to travel up to heaven. I can just leave it on my table. <laughs> That's good news, too. So shall we bow our heads in prayer? We now have some new friends over there. Our Heavenly Father and dear Jesus, we, knew, we invite you into our hearts and into our lives. We have to remember that we serve you by opening our heart and opening our home to others. And for that we say, amen. Have a good week, everyone. Be sure to keep smiling. Thank you so much. Thank you. like I'm out of practice. I'm gone for a week and I have to remember how to do all this stuff again. (laughs) I do feel a little out of practice traveling. Being gone for just a week to Portland felt like a much longer trek. There, There were a few issues along the way, like everyone on the Raven flight getting their bags bumped because they decided to fly a load of fish to Anchorage instead. Um, And even the return flight to Homer being sold out, so Joe had to drive to Anchorage to pick me up and bring me home, which added a whole other day to the trip. But overall, it was good, smooth traveling. I was reminded about how much I love being in airports. It's like being in this special bubble outside of time and normal behavior. There are such masses of people, but certain rules, spoken or unspoken, keep everybody in order and the processes running smoothly so everybody gets where they need to go. Um, You can always tell the regular travelers in the security line because they know, like, empty your pockets and take off your shoes and move quickly and push your bin out of my way. And then there's always those, like, rookie travelers that have to go through a a few times Times before they really understand what empty your pockets means. Instead of crowding towards the gates like in the old days, a change that I've seen these last few years is people wait for their boarding groups to be called. Everybody knows how to have their boarding pass or their phone out when they get up to the gate agent so they can scan and walk to the jetway quickly. And of course, once you're on the plane, people know to go to your seat and step out of the aisle so that you're not blocking the people behind you and the the plane can keep loading. Some of those instructions are announced But a lot of expectations that are followed goes unsaid because for the most part, people know how to behave in an airport. Simply being in an airport dictates the rules for their behavior. There are a lot of places that have specific rules for behavior, rules about when to speak and when to be quiet, who to talk to and who to leave alone, how to manage your personal belongings or your noise level or your physical space. There's a lot of rules that may not be written, but they're understood. And some of them we do learn over the years, like we learn as we're children and we remember those as we grow up or as adults, we get really good at walking into a new place and kind of reading the room and adjusting our behavior to match what's happening there. 
And those rules have to do with how we act in the different places we go. So think about the library. What are some of the rules that we know about how to act in a library? And if you're watching online, put some notes in the comments as well. How do we act in a library? No talking, be quiet. Those are the big ones, we know those. What are some of the other rules of behavior in the library? No eating, what was the? No smacking your gums, so the being quiet is more than about not talking. It's also about those other physical habits that we sometimes do that can be noisy. I always think about, about like, don't hog the photocopier. If there are people in line, don't, like, photocopy your novel. What are some of the other library rules that we know? Use the librarian. Yeah, use the card catalog. Or, you know, there's rules about the certain number of books that we can check out. School just started. And school has lots of rules that goes along with it. What are some of the rules that we know about how to behave in school? No running, no running in the hallways. <laughs> Raise your hand when you want to be called on. What are some of the other school rules? Be on time. Be on time. Don't be tardy for class. That's a big deal. <laughs> no, no pulling pigtails. Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> Any other school rules you can think about? Yes, don't interfere with other students studying or learning. I love that one. That was always one of my classroom rules. How about homes? In Alaska, what is the first thing we do when we go to somebody else's house? You take your shoes off, right? How about church? What are some of the unspoken rules for behavior in church? Don't sit in someone else's pew. <laughs> What's one of the other unspoken rules for church? Be on time, yeah. Try to get this congregation to be on time. <laughs> We're, we run on Homer time here. Our, our online crowd has noticed that, like, you don't really need to log in at 1055. You can log in at, like, 1107, and you'll still catch the beginning of the service. So, so be as on time as you can. That would be nice. What's another rule for church? Go ahead. Turn your phone off. That's a good one. Yeah. Nobody wants to be that one who, like, in the middle of some big silent prayer, their phone starts blaring. So, yeah, silencing our phones or leaving them in the car. How often do you see me in a suit outside of this building, right? Sometimes we have special ways that we dress for church. Sometimes we have our church clothes that we wear, whether it's every week or for special occasions. <clears throat> Any other rules unspoken? <laughs> don't answer the rhetorical questions the preacher asks. <laughs> Sometimes I say, you can think about this. Like, I don't want to know everything out loud. <laughs> um, Gary had said wear a mask. Yeah, right now we are in a phase where we are wearing masks to keep ourselves and others healthy. Yeah, so we've got these rules, spoken or otherwise. Like, you know, when I was a classroom teacher, you could walk in the door of my classroom and see the rules posted on the wall. There are no rules posted in this sanctuary, and yet we have this understood, uh, unspoken rule that governs our behavior here. Everything from wear your nice clothes, to be polite to everyone, to sit quietly, uh, to no running in church. Some people would like to enforce. I kind of enjoy the running in church. No, um, no excessive emotions. You know, and sometimes, most of all, when somebody asks, how are you, what is the acceptable answer? I'm fine. The places we go have rules, unspoken or not, that dictate our behavior. Priya Parker, in the book, The Art of Gathering, says that venues have scripts. We tend to follow rigid, if unwritten, scripts that we associate with specific locations. We tend to behave formally in courtrooms, boardrooms, and palaces. We bring out a different side of ourselves at the beach, at the park, 
at the nightclub. Venues have scripts, and church is no different. Sometimes those rules are helpful to manage a crowd of people all sharing a space. You know, if we were all trying to preach a sermon right now, nobody would be able to listen. But some of those rules inhibit our abilities to create deeper, more authentic relationships. So we have to make a conscious, concerted effort to break out of those scripts to change the rules so that we can interact differently. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, I'm not fine. One of the most powerful practices we have to break out of the script of expected behavior is the practice of vulnerability. It's the ability to be courage, to take a risk and go off script. And that can be really uncomfortable. We're so accustomed to saying, I'm fine, that we will say it even when we are dying inside, even when we are grieving, even when we're in pain, even when the whole world is falling apart. It takes courage to be vulnerable. It takes courage to say, I am not fine. Brene Brown says that vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when you have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not a weakness. It is our greatest measure of courage. We heard a courageous act of vulnerability in our scripture today. Talk about the whole world falling apart. Jesus had been betrayed and crucified. His disciples had fled, leaving the women at the foot of the cross to witness to his death. His body had been taken away and buried. And a few days later, when the women went to the tomb to anoint him, he was gone. And then when they tried to share this with the other disciples, they were dismissed as some hysterical women. And then Jesus appeared. The disciples were still hidden away in the locked room and they saw him. Jesus showed him his hands and his sides, the pain and the damage that had been done, and they rejoiced to see him. But that one disciple, Thomas, was not there. And when he heard this story from the others, his doubt and pain and sorrow came pouring out. He was honest with them, vulnerable, letting his fear and grief and anger show. I think sometimes we hear this scripture through a posture of arrogance. Like Thomas is demanding proof beyond reasonable doubt that this actually happened. But really, he's just asking to experience what the other disciples already got, a glimpse of Jesus just as he is, broken, battered, wounded, but alive and present. A week later, Jesus appeared again, and that time Thomas was there. Jesus went straight to him, and we can imagine Thomas squaring off with Jesus, tears in his eyes saying, I'm not fine. I'm scared, I'm angry, I'm grieving. I saw you die, and yet here you stand. I am not okay. This is breaking me. And in a profound act of hospitality, Jesus meets Thomas's brave vulnerability with his own, showing his wounds in solidarity with Thomas's pain, reaching out to him and saying, look, I am wounded too. You saw what they did to me. You heard me suffer and cry. I'm not fine either. I have wounds that didn't heal. Jesus sees and hears. He even welcomes Thomas's doubts his pain, his confusion, his wounds, and meets them with his own, not to show off and not to compete on who's hurt the worst, but to show that we're all hurt. We are all wounded. Some of us are better at hiding it than others. We may not walk around with open flesh wounds like Jesus did, but that doesn't mean that we aren't injured. Like Thomas, our pain can be deeper than flesh. It can be spiritual and still Jesus welcomes it. 
I have a friend who takes care of her elderly mother. Her mom injured her leg and got a wound on it. But the problem was the skin kept healing faster than the wound. So from an outside glance, her leg looked fine. But under the skin, the wound was still there, infected. It took a wound specialist to be able to heal the injury that looked fine on the outside. How many of us are walking around looking fine when we really have an injury within that's still throbbing and painful? A member of our congregation once said that she wished that grief came with an outward injury so that people could look at you and literally see the pain of grief and know that you are not okay. Healing doesn't happen until our wounds are made visible. If we continue to plaster over them, uh, just claiming that we're fine when really we're not, pasting on a smile, those wounds won't go away. They'll fester. They'll fester till we turn septic in the soul. They'll impact our relationships with God and with each other and to our own selves. Our wounds won't heal until we acknowledge them, until we're brave enough to say, I'm not fine, until we are able to be vulnerable and honest with one another and God, willing like Thomas to be able to express our doubt and fear and pain. Like Thomas <clears throat> and like Jesus, we are called to show our wounds. And we do that through the practice of vulnerability, knowing that our courageous act of vulnerability will be met with God's outrageous act of hospitality. In these next few weeks, may we be brave enough to admit, even just to ourselves, that we aren't really fine. May we take our doubts and our wounds to Christ, knowing that he will receive our pain in solidarity with his own. May we have the strength to break the script of the venue, knowing that God's deep welcome will receive us exactly as we are. And may we learn the true meaning of hospitality. Amen. You may have noticed that Ola is not with us today. Um, we have some special music during this time. I would like to invite Ray and Say to come forward to share our song of response with us. Our special music is Jesus Hands Were Kind Hands with Say on the piano and Ray on the violin.
Thank you so much for sharing your music with us today. As we enter into this time of prayer, <clears throat> I invite you to uh, lift up any joys or concerns that are on your heart and mind today. If you are one of our online worshipers, you are welcome to put those in the comments. Or if it's something private that you don't want on the internet, you can send us a private message as well and we will receive that. Uh, what are ways that we can be in prayer with you today uh, for the joys and concerns that are impacting your life right now? Shirley says she would like to thank everyone who's praying for Gary and that everything is okay. So glad to hear that. God bless you. Mm, that is wonderful. Other ways that we can be praying with you and for you. Peggy. I am grateful for the team that came in yesterday. Wonderful. Peggy says thank you to the team who came in to help uh, clean out and get the Sunday school classroom ready for the Sunday school kickoff, which will be September 11th. So thank you to those who volunteered your time and energy to get that room cleaned out and ready to go. It's wonderful. Thank you for your help. Other prayers? Yes, go ahead. Johan. Mm. Absolutely. Prayers for friend Johan, who is in the hospital right now. Prayers for his healing and total wellness. God, to your love, we trust this prayer. Mary. <laughs> yeah, she, Mary says she is so thankful that Marina showed up in church the other day. It is always such a blessing when our adult kids come home, isn't it? It's wonderful to see them. You know, I have, uh, I've lost practice with my prayer requests. When we have a joy, what do we say? Thank you, God. Hallelujah. So we are grateful for Marina's presence as well. Go ahead, Liz. For you? So prayers for surgery, prayers for your medical team, and for a swift recovery. God, to your love, we trust this prayer. Yeah. Caroline. Oh, for a friend, Shelly, whose husband has passed away. So prayers for Shelly and her friends and family in their grief. God, to your love, we trust this prayer. Yeah, go ahead, Franco. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Franco. Franco shared that his younger sister adopted a rescue dog a couple years ago and recently had to have it put down. But the prayer is a prayer of joy for the unconditional love that animals bring us. And for that, we say, thank you, God. Alleluia. Let's turn our hearts and minds toward God in prayer. God, you always invite us to be your guests. You always invite us into deeper friendship with you, deeper relationship with others, deeper understanding even of our own selves. You lavish us with your hospitality and lovingly welcome us into your family. You have shown us that providing hospitality to strangers opens a doorway into your kingdom. Remind us that when we offer hospitality to others, we are receiving Christ into our midst. We know that you receive these prayers that we spoke with our lips and those that we raise up in our hearts knowing that you receive them, care for them, and act on them. We thank you for your gracious and loving reception. Amen. With the confidence of children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. We are continuing our uh, continued exploration of different versions of the Lord's Prayer. So this one will found, feel very uh, traditional and familiar. This is the uh, King James Version of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, during our time of offering, I did want to raise up a couple of ways that you can offer uh, your prayers and your presence uh, to some of the upcoming ministries of the church. As Peggy mentioned, we do have Sunday school for all ages that will start on September 11th. We will have one room schoolhouse uh, in the fireweed room for children toddler through uh, middle school, and there will be appropriate breakouts based on age groups uh, for that Sunday school class. If you are interested, in volunteering for that, please see Peggy. Uh, our safe sanctuary policy says that we always have two unrelated adults with children at all times who have passed background checks. And so we are in that time right now of running background checks on all of our volunteers and doing everything we can to ensure that our church is a safe and welcoming place for all children. We will also have an adult class for high school students through adults uh, that will meet in the fellowship hall, and that is going to be called The Wired Word. It is a Bible study that is based on articles from around the world of current events. And the focus is how do we take our faith out into the world with us every week and what can be our faithful response to all the many things that are happening around the world now. It's a wonderful uh, scripture uh, study and uh, does connect us to the current events going on around the world. Uh, if you would like to uh, make a donation to the church to help uh, sustain the missions and ministries, if you are here in person, we do have an offering box in the back of the room, or you're welcome to visit our website uh, so you are able to donate online. And if you are worshiping online, you can see that our website is linked down below in the video, as well as our street address if you would like to send a check. I am always so grateful for your continued generosity, which keeps our church open and thriving and welcoming to our whole community. Let us back together as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Holy God, bless all of our offerings and transform them into healing for the wounded, hope for the disheartened, courage for the frightened, and faith for the embittered. We pray that you receive, bless, and multiply these gifts for the glory of your love here on earth. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able for our closing song. Our closing song is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 133 in your red hymnal. Savannah, I would request you turn the music up a little bit so I can hear it a little bit uh, more loudly. So thank you for that. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 133.
As God has loved you, love others. As the Holy Spirit has empowered you, empower others. As Christ has welcomed you, welcome others. Go in peace to love and to serve. Amen.